The FOMC minutes reveal little that was new, leaving financial markets to assume that tapering will start later this year, even as early as next month, and leaving emerging markets under pressure. Well, Yan Den from Ashmore Investments is here to tell us what happens now. Yan, emerging markets really are suffering. Why? Well, I think uh, one has to make a distinction between what's happening to asset prices and what's happening to their economies. And we, case in point is the, the, the manufacturing numbers out of China this morning, which have been picking up substantially. The point I'm making here is that uh, there is a huge piece of uncertainty that has now clouded the outlook for the global economy, particularly monetary policy in the United States. Every time there is a major piece of uncertainty, the knee-jerk reaction in the market is to sell emerging markets. We've seen this when Greece blew up, we saw it when, saw it when treasuries were downgraded, we saw it in the subprime crisis. Uh, the, what tends to happen here is that asset prices move far more than underlying fundamentals and get quite out of line with underlying risks. Well, essentially those asset prices were boosted by the massive liquidity that central banks were pumping into the financial systems. Not really. Uh, if you look at uh, where asset prices in emerging markets are trading now compared to, to where they were trading before the global crisis, they're in fact trading at much lower levels. Uh, spreads, for example, in external debt are nearly twice as wide as they were in 2007. So uh, that's not really true. And the vast bulk of the QE money, vast bulk of it has gone into the heavily indebted developed countries into their markets. Okay. So they're the ones that are sensitive to a withdrawal of liquidity. So what's happening now with the money that's coming out of the emerging markets? Where, where is it going? Well, you have to, uh, in order to answer that question, you need to ask yourself who is selling. There are essentially t five types of investors that are invested in emerging markets. There are hedge funds, banks, crossover investors, and then domestic and foreign real money, i.e. long-term sticky institutional money. Uh, what tends to be selling during times like this. Uh, the institutions that are selling are fast money, banks and crossover investors. Their money is coming out. A lot of it is going into cash because there's also uncertainty about the outlook for, as we know, for U.S. bonds as well as for U.S. stocks, which have been down six days in a row. I mean, it is quite interesting because, of course, the countries we're talking about here, they're being hit the most, India, Indonesia, um, and, and even Turkey. But it means what we've seen is some of these countries trying to protect themselves. The Turks, for example, have actually gone in there and, you know, uh, tried to stop the lira from falling. But it's not really succeeding, is it? Well, uh, that depends on your perspective. Uh, the Turks have gone in with a $100 million facility, which That's is really amount. absolutely peanuts. And that tells you something very important, which is that emerging market central banks are actually perfectly happy to see their currencies weaken a bit because that provides relief for their economies. It makes their exporters more competitive. There is a limit, though. Uh, the limit we have seen reached in places like Brazil, where the central bank has come out and signaled very clearly that we don't really want to see our currency weaken too much because then we get passed through into inflation and then higher bond yields locally. So uh, for now, the, a, a moderate adjustment in their currencies is absolutely welcome. In fact, in Asia uh, combined, Asian central banks have only intervened to the tune of $13 billion so far since the beginning of June, which is really a tiny amount when you take into account that India's central bank alone has $270 billion of foreign exchange reserves. I was just going to say, can we put this into some sort of perspective of the sort of size of flows of funds that we're seeing at the moment? Well, it's relatively small amounts of money. Um, the vast majority of local of bonds in emerging markets are owned by domestic institutions. These domestic institutions are not selling. What we're seeing here are fast money flows. A lot of leverage was put into the market in April as the market wrongly anticipated a flow from Japanese investors in and try to front run that with a lot of leverage. So the, the technicals got a bit stretched in the first half of the year and that's part of the reason why we're seeing a reversal now. Okay, so you have these massive amounts of, um, of, of funds that the emerging markets own. Where, are the, where do they have them invested so that if they started selling, won't there be some sort of kickover? Well, the, the pension systems in emerging markets are, are growing very rapidly. But they're also very recent inventions. Um, if you think back to a country like Brazil, 10 years ago, Brazil basically didn't have a fixed coupon bond market. Um, the, the emergence of bond markets in, in EM is really on the back of the development of pension systems. But because these pension systems are so young, uh, that many of them are still not allowed to invest in foreign assets. And that means that you really have a buyer base, uh, a very solid uh, buyer base within individual emerging market countries. And that's one of the primary reasons why, for example, we're not heading to a new Asian crisis. Okay, I was just going to ask you whether or not there would be. But just finally and briefly, um, Jan, 
what does this mean for the global economic recovery? Well, the, we, we really have to focus on the real vulnerabilities here. The real vulnerabilities are in those countries that have a lot of debt. They're the ones who are not going to be able to stomach rising real interest and rates. And we're talking developed countries. Then. Absolutely. Heavily indebted developed countries like the United States or Europe will really struggle if real interest rates move a lot higher than what they've moved so far. We've already seen mortgage applications in the United States literally halve since May. Yeah, and thank you very much indeed. Very welcome.